I'm Joyce Brewer, live in Macomb, where Jamie Lynn Spears gave birth to a little girl at the hospital behind me. How this town is reacting to all the attention coming up. And I'm Joyce Brewer, live downtown. I'll tell you what you need to know before you come here for Jubilee Jam. The sign outside this home says God did it, and so did 300 volunteers who shuttled to the Extreme Makeover home every day. And Scott, you mentioned that I had on a ball gown. It's actually a little different this year. That's something else that's different. It's actually a cocktail dress. Cameras are posted at eight intersections designed to catch drivers who run red lights. The offenders get a letter in the mail with a picture of their car breaking the law. Some 16 WAPT viewers wanted to know who's accountable for deciding where the cameras went up. For them, it's not a matter of red, yellow, or green. It's an issue of black and white. Hi, Scott. More than 30 acts are expected here for Jubilee Jam. Some of the headliners are going to be the ZZ Top, the 3-6 Mafia, and the Mississippi Mass Choir. Now, tomorrow night about this time, folks will be getting here because on this main stage behind me, ZZ Top will be taking the stage here on State Street near the Old Capitol. Now, already, parts of State and Capitol Streets are closed off, so organizers can put up the stages, lights, and equipment. At last check, more than 2,000 tickets were pre-sold for Jubilee Jam. We also also asked the Jackson Arts and Music Foundation and JPD about the possibility of rain and traffic concerns. Yeah, I think it's probably a little bit more difficult now because we really don't have the police officers out here at, as we will have when the actual event starts. So it's really important to kind of pay attention to what's been out there in the media as far as street closings and, you know, plan alternate routes whenever possible to, stay, to avoid traffic tires. Well, you know what? A little breeze and a little wetness in uh, downtown Jackson in June is not necessarily a bad thing. It might cool things off just a bit, but, you know, as far as the weather goes, Jubilee Jam has a long history, and some of those years it's rained a little bit, but you know what? We've had a good time every time. And now, in case you want to come down here for Jubilee Jam, you should know the gates open Friday at 6 p.m., then reopen Saturday at 3 p.m. A single-day pass for adults is $23. A weekend pass is $40. For more information on what you can expect at Jubilee Jam, just go to the As Seen On section of WAPT.com. We're live downtown with a preview of Jubilee Jam. I'm Joyce Brewer, 16 WAPT News. And now tonight's Who's Accountable report. Serious allegations from a JPS teacher who says a student hit her last year and the student hasn't been held accountable. Terry Palmer sent 16 WAPT this email. It said, I thought I was going to the proper channels by first filing charge with, with the police department. I went to court on the date that they gave me and it had been thrown out. I'm not going to let this girl think that she can hit me and change schools and it's over. And we uncovered if the student will be held accountable for this alleged assault and how often other teachers are victimized by their students. I made the jump and she, she pushed my head over so they did make that. Mm -hmm. And then I turned, turned, turned that way and she did it again. It, it makes me upset just for the fact that this young lady is getting away with something she didn't have any reason that I know of to put a hand on me. Hey, PE teacher Terry Palmer says she was shocked when a sixth grade student at Powell Middle School hit her in March 2008. The girl had just gotten into a fight with a classmate, then for some reason approached Palmer and hit her in the head twice. Palmer says the student was arrested, and court records show the girl was taken to the juvenile detention center, then placed on home detention. Palmer filed assault charges, but a year later, the girl still hasn't been held accountable. It's, it's all been just pushed under the rug because uh, I was given one day for court and she was given one day. And because I wasn't there, they dismissed it. Palmer showed us her court notice for June 9, 2008 at 1.30. That's when she showed up to court. But Palmer says the staff at Juvenile Justice Court told her the student showed up the week before on June 2nd. And that to me, is, that, that needs some serious explanation. Virgie Jones is president of the Jackson Federation of Teachers. She wishes Palmer and other teachers would come to the union for help when they don't feel safe on the job. More and more, Jones hears about teachers who are victimized by their students but don't speak up. Even on the elementary level, they uh, are actually hitting the teachers when they are angry about something and the teachers trying to reprimand them. This incident doesn't stand alone. In April 2008, cell phone video captured a Baltimore, Maryland student beating a teacher who told the student to sit down. The student was found not guilty of assault and school violence charges. 
even with such graphic video evidence, the student was only convicted of disrupting class. Palmer is afraid the teenager who hit her won't be held accountable at all. I know she needs to go to court and need to know that you can't just do this and then you scot free. She is going to get her day in court. Uh, it's going to be put back on the docket. This was a mistake made by one of my staff, and I take uh, the, the buck stops with me. I take responsibility for it. The Juvenile court judge Bill Skinner admits a court mistake led to the dismissal of the student's assault case. Someone mixed up the dates for Palmer and the student to appear in court. Skinner blames an overcrowded docket of juvenile cases. In the last two years, he's heard about 20 cases where JPS teachers were allegedly assaulted by students. Many of them were dismissed because the teacher didn't want to take it to trial. Skinner says teacher safety is a priority to him and apologizes to Palmer for the mix-up that's taken a year to clear up. I regret that it took her calling Channel 16 to get this back on the docket. Now, Ms. Palmer is looking forward to getting her summons to appear in court to face that student who allegedly assaulted her. We'll let you know when that happens. Now, on the bigger issue of teacher safety, it's such a concern for the Jackson Federation of Teachers. It's going to send out a workplace safety survey to educators this spring. Then you, the union will present those results to the JPS school board in hopes of making classrooms safer for teachers. We're going to see if we can find some offenders today. Virginia McGrain holds drivers accountable when they park in spots reserved for people with disabilities. The retired nurse has arthritis and scoliosis. She also drives her disabled friends to errands and doctor's appointments. Able-bodied people will take advantage of the handicapped parking places running just for a few minutes. And it happens at all places, drug stores, grocery stores, post offices, you name it. She puts a pink placard on an offender's windshield. It reads, parking here for just a minute is 60 seconds too long. The response is shocking. From thank you for the reminder, I appreciate it, to being very profound in their language. People have cursed at you? Yes. Because they were in the wrong. Right. So it should be no surprise the reaction we got. Look, hey, here, in the blue zone. Parked in the blue zone. And she is not disabled. She has not got a tag on. When we found people with no tags or placards parked in reserve spots at the old Canton Road Walgreens. I have a quick question. Do you have a legal tag to park in this spot? Mm -hmm. Do you have a legal tag to park in this spot? Why are you driving away? So why are you parked here? I weren't in there five minutes, you know. But just because you're in there for five minutes, what if this lady wanted to pull up and take the spot? Exactly. I apologize. Okay. What's your name? I'd rather not say, but I won't do it again. Ridgeland police say officers write tickets several times a week for illegal parking. We've also heard complaints drivers will borrow a grandparent or disabled friend's car that has a tag. So RPD even monitors cars with tags if the driver does not appear to have a disability. Naturally, when we see those kind of people, especially if they're in something like a jogging suit or whatever, you kind of sense they're not handicapped. So we make certain that we stop them and question them and if issue a citation if necessary. In Ridgeland, there's a $50 fine, double that for the second offense. In Rankin County, it's $142 for the citation and court costs. In Madison, it's $70 for each offense. The maximum is $200. Those parking spots are really at a premium. In 2006, more than 75,000 disabled parking plates were on Mississippi cars. By last year, there were more than 81,000. The state tax commission says it could be due to a growing elderly population. The Madison County tax collector gets regular requests for a disabled tag or placard. They just need a form with a medical excuse and their doctor's signature. Somebody who looks healthy may not be able to walk more than that 200 feet, you know, from their car to their destination. That's the most common reason they're issued, along with heart and lung conditions. If you don't have one of these on your car and you park in a reserved spot, McGrain or someone else may leave a note on your car.
car. It's kind of like a full warning, like a little slap on the hand to say, look, maybe you have a stop to think that you've taken somebody else's place that really needs it. You can report someone with no tag or placard who's parked in a spot reserved for someone with a disability. Call the non-emergency number for police, not 911. Put a note on the offender's windshield, or you can get a pink placard from the Coalition for Citizens with Disabilities. There's a link to their website at WAPT.com. I'm Joyce Brewer, 16 WAPT News.